Hi, nice to see you again, or maybe also for the first time. My name is Katja, uh, maybe known as She Drives Mobility from Twitter. Um, I'm trying to um, build up a climate-relevant mobility for our future because um, for me there's really a huge uh, demand for this because the transport sector is still with growing emissions, with growing car uh, pools, with growing everything um, and not um, going into stagnation or degrowth. For me, it's really yeah, hard to understand why we are not uh, politically winked by decisions who um, can solve this problem because there's everything out there. Because I think that, that people always have the ideas um, of what can change the mobility from car-centric to really mobility as a choice. Um, so for me, um, mobility is not a technical part of our life, even if we really like uh, technic um, here in Germany, it's about changing behavior. And today I talked to Matthew Baldwin, and I'm really um, proud to have him here in my She Drives Mobility Livecast, um, because he, as a bureaucrat from the EU, has a really um, own way um, of solving this problem we are right now in. Um, he is looking upon pedestrians, he's looking upon vulnerable people, he's looking upon um, what kind of costs are we now sunk, uh, sunk sinking into the car industry, not the car industry, the car mobility, uh, which is not so transparent to every one of us. And I think it's it's really good to see mobility as a kind of economic topic because when we are um, looking upon the costs that car mobility is um, yeah, putting into our society in whole, also to people like me who don't own a car, it's not a fair system. It's a system that uh, established uh, mobility that uh, excluded many people. Um, and I think we need to be back to a system which I call the aquarium of mobility in the streets of our cities that we uh, reduce the space for cars, that we reduce the pace of mobility because the car broke it down. The, the, the necessity uh, of um, yeah, having different kind of uh, spaces in the road for the cars and the uh, so-called muscle driven mobility has come from the ability of cars to be much more um, speeded like the um, human mobility is and I think we have to go back to the roots and make our cities livable um, while we I change the streets for something where everyone can survive, even if you don't have uh, uh, roads just for cars. And I think um, this kind of um, topic like shared spaces and shared streets is really nice because we can look into the eyes of the other and can be in a commitment how we can um, go further. Pedestrians will be not so vulnerable like they are at the moment and they won't be forgotten anymore. And Matthew has really nice uh, ideas and also nice advice where to look at um, to change this for the better, even not banning cars, but um, transferring cars into a kind of mobility which is just used, pragmatic, and by special people who have this need of car drive. And also to think about how rural areas can be um, linked to cities. And um, for me, it, it was a really uh, short 45 minutes talk because there were so many informations. Um, so I wish you the best of pleasure with him talking with me about um, his kind of vision. And if you like to um, yeah, support me, you can do this via pay PayPal or Steady HQ. You find this um, in my um, show notes. And now enjoy our talk. Have a nice day. Matthew. <laughs> Hello. Hello. It's so funny uh, because um, uh, every talk I have about uh, mobility or uh, change of behavior uh, and um, uh, as we talked before in, in uh, the last year, I didn't get to know that I can do live talks without being at your table, at your desk. 
And now Corona uh, has uh, opened me the door for this new, really nice format because everyone has the time sometimes for me. Um, but before we uh, will go into our different topics, um, can you please uh, inter introduce yourself to the audience? I will, Katja. Thanks a lot for having me on. So my name is Matthew Baldwin. I work uh, for the European Union in the European Commission, and I have the honor to be the EU's coordinator for road safety and sustainable urban mobility. So we met on Twitter, and uh, you were kind enough to say, let's have a chat. And it's I can't think of a nicer way to spend a cloudy Friday morning in Brussels. <laughs> So you just take up um, some of the topics. What, uh, if you think about livable cities, what kind of pi mm. picture would you draw? Well, I think I think we've, we, we were chatting about this earlier. I mean, when we think about a livable city, I think our definition of it has already changed with COVID. Uh, I think we all started to appreciate the air quality we got with a lot less car traffic going around. We saw a huge increase in cycling public authorities stepping in with uh, these famous pop-up bike lanes. I'm happy to see many of them becoming permanent. But also, and we don't talk about it enough, more space for pedestrians. With everyone socially distancing, you have these great lines of people on the streets waiting to go into the baker's shop. How do you go past them? So they, they were taking space away from car parking spaces and allocating it. And you got everyone thinking about the space in our cities. Um, and so we often talk about healthy cities But we don't talk about enough about healthy individuals within a city doing things that are healthy in terms of air quality, in terms of their physical well-being. Um, so that's all. That's what I mean by sustainable and livable cities, at least in terms of mobility. And of course, there's lots of other ways of looking at it. And for me, um, I had to embrace um, that people call me activist because um, I am the um, kind of a girl or lady. I don't know. Um, to, to really uh, think about how we can change the world for the better. And I always have an eye also on the people who have um, a kind of invisible mobility. And um, so me as the activist, talking to you as someone more in, in, in the politics, um, we are doing the same, yeah, we are, we are trying to, to embrace the, the system we have, but to change it for the better. And of course, um, if Can I interrupt I, you, I'm a bureaucrat. <laughs> I'm a bureaucrat that learns from activists. And I mean, if, 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 if we didn't have NGOs and people like you pushing for these changes, it would be really hard for people like me to try to, to, try to see change within you know, big bureaucratic organizations or with, with governments. So you probably an essential service. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, go on. I never, I've never, I've never seen this, but I, I really appreciate it. Um, but for me, it's also like um, it's 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 good to have these different roads because, of course, I've been in this kind of systems where you need uh, seven pe people to sign an idea to to have it like done three years in advance. And um, for me, it's really interesting to look into this kind of systems, also like the European Union and what they are doing for all this kind of thinking as also Europe as a, as a walkable city, maybe. Um, and I like to ask you, um, you are trying to tackle things also from the cost side. And this is really like pragmatic, uh, where I am always like kind of the emotional uh, part of this change. And um, so what are you thinking about the cost we are at the moment putting into our system of mobility? Is it equal for every one of us or do you want to change something? Well, that's a really good question. And, you know, going back to the first thing you said about what makes a sustainable and livable city, I think you and I would probably agree, actually, on, you know, what we want. And we want a green city, literally green, and we want trees and so on. But unfortunately, we also need to persuade voters, people who pay, you know, taxes, city planners um, of what's important. And therefore, we need to develop the argument of, of costs and underlying costs in our system. And we've done a big study in the European Union, done for us by the University of Delft, which is on the, sorry, it's terrible techno speak, but it's the external costs of transport, meaning the costs that we impose as users of transport on the rest of society, which are not picked up. Not all external costs are 
um, are not picked up. So some of them are picked up, like 30% of them are covered by taxes and charges of different kind, but at least 70% are not. And the number, Katia, is astronomical. It's 1 trillion euros a year. Uh, a big chunk of our GDP. So between 5 and 7% of our GDP is external cost of transport. And what's really interesting to me in terms of urban mobility is where those costs are if you break them down. 40% of them are environmental. So we know them, CO2 emissions and how we tackle those. Air quality, killing 500,000 people a year prematurely in the European Union. Uh, um, a noise, an underestimated environmental factor. You know, when you drive a noisy vehicle down a street, it imposes a cost in terms of health and other people and general habitat degradation. So that's 40%, roughly speaking, about 400 billion euros a year. 30% of the cost is road congestion. Hello. Hello, Brussels. I can see out of my window the blockages. <laughs> and 30%, and something we always forget or often forget, is the costs of road crashes, particularly in terms of the people killed and the people seriously injured. And that's just in the European Union. And if you take those figures globally, and of course, I don't have the global numbers, it's much, 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 much higher. Um, road deaths are much worse. Air quality is worse. So it, it's it, when you look at those things, and then you start you can start to walk around those numbers and poke them and kick them with your foot and look at them in lots of different ways. And you mentioned uh, equity. Um, uh, if, you, if you're serious about addressing those figures, you're going to have to get serious about our over-dependence on the use of the private conventionally fueled car in our cities. It's not always a popular thing to say, sometimes around here, sometimes in, in, in city politics or national politics. But that's what this is really about. And sometimes people say, well, yeah, we have to be really careful about that because, you know, if we're going to tackle these external costs, then we need to do road pricing. And then how are the poor people going to drive their cars around the cities? Well, OK, that's a fair question. But who owns the cars? Who uses the cars in cities? If you look at the numbers here in Brussels, only about half the households have access to a car. And trust me, that number is higher in the richer neighborhoods and it's lower in the poorer neighborhoods. I saw some data recently, which you're probably aware of, two thirds of the poorest households in Berlin do not have access to a car. So if we're doing road pricing, you're actually starting to address, you're not driving further inequality, you're starting to address inequality. Some people on the left of politics say, well, you're still saying that, you know, it's only for rich people who get to drive their cars around cities. Well, my answer to that is, you know, we are living in a market economy based system. If you go to an expensive restaurant, you pay more for your meal. And I'm saying if you're driving your car on an expensive piece of road in this cost argument or an expensive time of day when a lot of other people are trying to use it, you should expect to pay more for it. And right now, to say I say to my left wing friends, the rich people are not paying at all for their use of um uh, the, the use of this public space, which we funded out of all of our taxes. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a complicated argument, but I think it's something we need to bear in mind. The other way of looking at it, Katya, is to look at it in terms of space allocation in the cities. So you can look at it from a cost argument, look at it from space allocation. And again, the whole COVID crisis has really made us think about how we allocate space. And people are saying, wait a minute, my road, the space that I live in, it's got two lines of parked cars, and then there's a space in the middle for cars to move up and down. Where's my space? So I think it's an interesting time to be discussing these things. But um, how do you think? Is it about lobbyism? or Because the narratives, and especially in Germany, as we are calling ourselves Schlüsselindustrie, Automobilindustrie, uh, and um, we are really not able to think a future without private-owned cars, um, is it about, as you are in Brussels, is it about lobbyism or where do all these wrong narratives come from? Because it's always the, the, the story of the poor man who can't go to work without his car. And it's, it's, it's not true because um, people who own less money in Germany, they have the less uh, car mobility. And for me, it's really astonishing how everyone is believing this kind of narratives. Do you have kind of yeah, uh, signatures where we can look at, but what we need to change also in our storytelling, maybe? Well, I mean, we're entering the really interesting political discussions. I should have said right at the start, I'm a, I'm a bureaucrat and I'm not 
pretending to be a politician speaking for any party. But I mean, what you're what you're we're, we're talking around here, in essence, is whether or not we should be banning the car. And again, I don't think we should ban the car, even from cities, because it's you know we still live just about in a free and open democratic society. And um, you know, if you take the example of smoking, uh, which is acknowledged to be extremely dangerous, we still don't ban smoking; it's restricted, and and for good public health reasons. So I think we need to look at other measures than simply banning things. And again, if you go back to your argument, even inside cities, and I'll come on to the outside cities in a moment, but even inside cities, parents with disabled children, um, doctors, you know, going to do emergency operations, uh, plumbers um, who need to carry all their tools in the back of the car. I mean, I don't think we're going to be saying to any of these groups of people, you're never going to drive a car. By the way, their access to you know, to go around cities will be a lot better in a road priced world where people are not driving the car if it's costing them real money for, for things that are not necessary. And so the plumber should have better access. They say here in Brussels, you know, if every cyclist that is replacing a car, the access for the other cars is easier. <laughs> so, you know, we can create a snowball effect. Outside cities, look, I think we should acknowledge the arguments do get more difficult because you know, where are you? Where are you? You're somewhere in Germany, Katya, right? Now you're speaking from, yeah. From my, I mean, from if, my parents, if yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, that's great. So, you, you, if you're in a rural area um, and and you need to get to Berlin, it's it's still it's quite hard to see in in, in the current setup. And of course, we need better public transport. We better we need better last mile things. It's quite hard to get around without a car, and that may apply also to 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 poor people i think we've seen that and then you can see the anger when institutions like the european union or national governments say you know you'll get, you 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 end up with the gilet jaune the yellow vest protest so we have to be very careful about those arguments but still people underestimate how much money they put from their household budgets into cars uh, it's it's almost like we have two currencies. There's the money we spend on a car, which is untouchable, and then you know then we buy children's clothing and and you know uh, with the rest. And uh, sometimes I I wonder if we we've, we've individually collectively got our, our priorities right on that. I do understand if there's no alternative, if you can't do your job without a car, we have to find a way. So this is about being reasonable therefore if we if we're talking about cities out the car is going to continue to be pretty ubiquitous i'm willing to predict to you hopefully it'll be more electrically powered or hydrogen powered in the future it's going to be still pretty ubiquitous in the decades to come how do we manage that then in the context of urban mobility we have to be creative answers may be we build a lot more car parks on the outside of cities and maybe those car parks will be free and then if you're coming in from an hour and a half outside Hanover, you can leave your car on the outskirts of Hanover and you get a free bus or you can pick up a free bike to go into the center, do your business and leave. Um, there are ways in which there's a lot of creative ways in which we can work with the world as it is rather than annoying people, angering people by saying, let's just pretend the cars don't exist so we can vanish them away. But sometimes I think um, that it's, it's, it's always my role not to be annoyed, not to be angry. I didn't have a car at all. And um, the people who are driving cars are standing on my shoulders. And as you can get back to the, the example of my family here in Emsland, um, my daddy has Parkinson. He's not able to drive a car anymore. So he has no mobility at all um, if my mom won't drive him. And I think we have to tackle both sides. Also embrace that people still will need a car, but also embrace there are people like me who, who are, are not willing to have a car. And there are people like my dad who need some alternatives, also in rural areas. What are your ideas about this? Well, I think what you're talking about is we need a much broader conversation than the one we conventionally have. Um, and I mean that both for road safety, by the way, and on, on urban mobility, where, you know, too often we've talked about road, road safety as an engineering challenge. OK, in, in which case then we'd see, you know, catch his dad as some sort of engineering problem, you know, no longer can drive a car. <laughs> we need solutions which work. Um, and so this whole question of accessibility, inclusivity, uh, I mean, gender, I mean, I think we've underinvested in all of these different topics in terms of our mobility. And the short answer is we need answers for everybody. Another example, looking at towns, 
um, the Dutch and the Germans, to some extent, have been very successful with these things they call Wunderfen. I don't know what it is in German. That's the word in Dutch, which are these mixed use neighborhoods and cars and uh, bicycles. I've I've lost you on the screen. Oh, you're back. Sorry. Um, cars and buses and bicycles and pedestrians are allowed, but in a very kind of jumbled up way with uh, street architecture and everyone has to slow down and you have this to stop principle so that the, the heavy and the powerful and the um, fast to defer to the slow and the vulnerable and the weak so that, you know, as a, as a car gives way to the bicycle and the bicycle gives way to the pedestrian and so on. Now, that's all great. And then you bring disability into the question. Some uh, visually impaired people have told me, for example, that without the old fashioned curb, delineating where the pavement is and where the rest of the space is, they feel very vulnerable. We built bike lanes to make them safe, which go behind bus stops. And then again, the visually impaired, they get off the bus and they can't see, you know, uh, there's a bike lane there. So we just, I'm not saying any of these things are done by bad people or they're wrong or anything else. We've just got to bring more people into the conversation. So your dad's mobility needs need to be part of the conversation every bit as my mobility needs to. It's a fundamental democratic principle. Yeah, so is it like going back to older days, having this kind of mobility aquarium where everyone was floating around in his own system and uh, which was uh, broken because the speed of the car was so much away from a human uh, ability to, to be like speed? Is it is it also um, yeah connecting this kind of uh, sign you have in your back 30 uh, to reduce uh, speed in, in, in cities? Yeah. I love the phrase mobility aquarium. That's a new one on me. I'm going to use it and I'm going to pretend it's mine. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, or mobility zoo uh, as another idea. Um, uh, look, it means different things. In, uh, we need to find the solutions which work in different places. Um, I mean, to take the 30 kilometer speed limit, uh, which I'm very passionate about, um, uh, Where you can't ensure the segregation of vulnerable road users, which in cities basically means bicyclists and walkers, and this is what we call the safe system, the vision zero approach to road safety, we basically just have to slow everybody down. That's where the speed limit comes in. You know, that way we might still have crashes. We might still have, you know, accidents, as, as sometimes people call them, but they're not necessarily going to kill or seriously injure people. That's the goal. So the speed limit is like what we can do where we don't segregate. And some people, by the way, would say the safe in a, in a shared space, 20 kilometers is the kilometers an hour is a safe thing. But then you invest and you build infrastructure which segregates and you have the bike lane and it's a properly segregated bike lane. And then you have maybe a main artery going into the city, going to Hanover's case, you know, the road which is taking you in on your free bus from the car park that you built at the edge of Hanover. Maybe the speed limit on that road, if there's no bicycles and pedestrians and it's properly protected, that could be 50. Um, it's the same principle when you go outside cities. On a motorway, and I know I'm entering very dangerous territory here talking about this in the German context, but on a fully protected, modern, well-constructed motorway, the evidence is it's safe to go 120, 130 kilometers an hour. You know, you're probably safer than a lot of other roads because there's no vulnerable road users nearby. The cars are constructed. So you, under, you get the picture. We have to find different circumstances, different solutions for different circumstances. I saw on the, on the Twitter feed, there was a, uh, sorry, I've forgotten the gentleman's name, but he was raising the question about whether we should have segregated infrastructure. And I know it was an interesting debate. Um, um, uh, in cycling, there's a theory for everything uh, if you dig far enough. And there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a theory which says, you know, bicycles are vehicles. They have the right to be taken seriously, they're vehicles. And uh, it's, it's you know, get over it, cars. We're here and we're going to ride around down the middle of the street. I mean, I, I kind of applaud the, the sentiment and the bravery. Unfortunately, the evidence shows it's, it's quite dangerous and that we lose a lot of people that way. 70% of the people who die in cities are vulnerable road users. If you drive around in a city in a car, you're pretty safe. Unfortunately, if you're not in a car, you're not so safe. Um, so I'm rambling on. You stop me. 
so maybe we can have again a look at this kind of cost uh, block. Um, you are talking about two currencies, one we spend um, for mobility and one for cars. And I really like um, the segregation of this two. Well, sorry, no, one, one, on, one on, I just interrupt you, I'm sorry. What I meant yeah. was you have one thing for our mobility, which is tends to be just about the car, and then the rest of it is the rest of our okay, lives. That's right, but yeah. We can't the car budget. <laughs> and so I know how, some people have no choice. I mean, how, how will you tackle that we think about uh, mobility, not just car centric and what kind of um, costs or kind of nudging uh, are you um, doing in your work? Well, again, it goes back to the sort of philosophical point for me that car drivers are not bad people. They're responding to the pattern of incentives that we as a society, not the European Union, but the whole of society gives them. And if you live, uh, I'll give a Belgian example. If you live uh, 20 kilometers outside Antwerp, the public transport is not so great. You work for a company that, um, uh, because of the way the Belgian tax system works, basically gives you terrific tax advantages for having a company car. So it's a huge advantage for that. You drive to your work in Brussels where maybe you have a free parking space. So it's a no-brainer. You take your car. And then you worry and you're kind of annoyed by some of the congestion you arrive on the way. But, you know, but but the basic fundamental individual choice is set for you by society. It's not the car driver's fault. that That's what he or she is given. It is often he, by the way. But, you know, um, so we need to change that pattern of incentives, as you say, to nudge it a bit. And, and I have a lot of sympathy with the concept of paying the true price of that trip. I have a lot of sympathy with trying to improve the public transport links, including, you know, buses in rural areas. Again, back to your dad, that may be the best solution for him, a good rural bus service. Um, uh, and particularly when you come into the city, recognizing the sharp increase, as far as we can see, in the costs that you can impose on the city because of the, of the very limited space involved. So that's where the nudging comes in. And it's actually not that radical or green a vision. It's fundamental market economics, actually, about bringing that to bear and saying, you know, we expect to pay for things that we use. And that's really what it's about. For me, it's so funny because in, 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 in Germany, we always have this sentence, der Markt regelt das, and we um, separate uh, car... You'll have, to, you'll have to translate that for me. The market will do the right thing. For We, we trust in <laughs> the market. But we separate um, the car from this kind of market system because we, we have uh, hidden costs. We have costs that everyone is p um, paying. Uh, either, even if I don't have a car, I pay for cars and infrastructure. For me, it's, yeah, um, what you are it's taking. Exactly the same point. It's exactly the same point about it's in another way. It's the external cost. Yeah. In other words, you, you can look at it in different ways. I'm not, I'm not, um, pretending to be an econ economist here, but basically the external cost is an example of market failure. If, if, you, if you just allow, as you say, the market to do everything and you don't keep an eye on the external costs, you will end up with a very imperfect solution, including from the driver's perspective. Because yeah. back to our, our guy who's living 20 kilometers outside Antwerp, he's sitting in congestion. He's sitting unable to get to his journey where he wants to be on time and often he will ring in he'll say I'm, I'm sorry i'm late i'm stuck in traffic and the answer is you are the traffic <laughs> you're part of this and you're just so it's it's about trying to just bring price price into the system that's all transparency sorry i'm stuck on the no, no, no. it's it's about all that's, that's good um because i think always that is that is the maybe the biggest point of uh, changing uh, car mobility that people feel really um, comfortable with their car because they are on their own. Um, and, and maybe as uh, Hermann Knoflacher said, uh, the, the car is a part of me, also of my personal behavior, of my way, how I listen to music, how I will have my surroundings. And so it's a part of my uh, personality, which is really weird, but maybe a mm. bit of a truth. And, um, and you have to point on yourself if you're uh, in a traffic jam you're part of the traffic jam but if you're um riding uh if you're using uh, public transport it's always someone you can point at <laughs> it's not this this is this and it's for me it's it's sometimes a really struggle for people to to leave the car behind because we are always 
thinking about 100%. And we are always thinking um, new mobility should um, solve all problems we have within two days. We don't have this kind of yeah, sympathy of, of having like a real long time to change it. And for me, um, and that is the next point maybe, um, it's always forgetting so many people. And as we talk about gender and mobility, which is a topic um, uh, who are, yeah, who I'm also interested in because it's not a just male and female, but it's about different life lifestyles and it's about um, mobility. Come mobility, you can see it's on the roads. And care work mobility is for me invisible because the, the, the mobility is not paid. Mm -hmm. So um, what kind of role does gender play in this game? What do you think? Well, this is a dangerous, this is a dangerous um, territory for a, for a white aging male to be saying to the, to the queen of mobility, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I'll have a go and you tell me if I get it wrong. Um, and thanks for the invitation. I think we've underinvested generally in this issue of gender in transport. Um, I mean, we've moved on a bit in the past, for example, the last 10, 20 years, we've, we've become aware that the, the crash dummies that we use for, for testing whether cars are safe was based on the, on the male form. And then they, they, what was happening here? You know, in the same kind of crashes, women with the same seatbelts, with the same airbags were coming out more injured. Well, because the design had been built around the male form. So that's the, the first kind of chink of light into the consciousness that there may be some issues around gender that we we'd not consider then there's the whole issue around violence against women and and here i want to mention because i i kind of thought you might raise this i've been reading up a bit there's a really great study done by the european transport workers federation against violence against women uh drivers of buses trains and so on uh, so it's a non-negligible problem here there's another chink of light, another angle. Um, we, in our sustainable urban mobility planning within the European Union, we have these things called SUMPs, Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan. We've just put out, um, this is advertising, by the way, so apologies. We just put out a new guide on, it's called Gender Equity and Vulnerable Groups. Um, and uh, that's just come out and it's getting a lot of praise because it's encouraging cities to think about gender issues in the context of um of, of vulnerability. Um, there's also a, a big network, growing network, and you might be interested in this, Katya, of women in transport, you know, so sharing issues and of these kinds of things. But rather than just kind of paying conventional wisdom a pat on the back, I want to I want to say, and maybe you should tell me if I'm being controversial here, I think we have to move beyond just the simple concept of gender mainstreaming, which is what this is about. And gender mainstreaming is great as far as it goes. Um, and I think we have to ask the question around, are women a vulnerable group per se, or is this really just about we collectively, but it is basically men who have been running society for all these years, not addressing the fundamental needs of half of the population? Because if it's the case, and women are not per se vulnerable or inherently vulnerable, when I say, yeah, you know, women are a vulnerable group, that's not going to be taken well, I suspect, by people like you or others who don't consider themselves vulnerable. So I'm going to piss them off and then, you know, it's going to be you patronizing old man. But there's a second problem, and this comes from talking to my great friend Marianne Weinrich, and I don't think she'd mind me mentioning, who's the cycling ambassador for Denmark um, and, and has done a lot of thinking about these things. And she said, if you... Um, if you say all women are vulnerable, then the women who don't consider themselves vulnerable take themselves out of the equation. So then they're not involved in issues around the city design and the city service, around all the issues about traveling with kids or elderly people. And guess what? It tends to be the women who do that. Um, and, and yeah, and, and all the issues around sexual violence against women on transport. Um, because there is... I mean, there is a case for saying that women are more vulnerable and are facing a much greater risk in terms of being uh, sexually harassed or, or attacked or raped on, on public transport, for example. Um, so, um, and so I'm sorry, I'm going on, but this, the last point I want to make is, again, is vulnerability in relation to things like cycling. Um, if we say, uh, be careful out there, ladies, women, it's dangerous, it's dangerous out there. We know that one of the reasons that people don't cycle 
is fear, fear of cycling. And there's an Australian academic, you can see I've really done my research for this, um, called uh, uh, Jan, Jan Gerard, who has looked at all these attitudes to risk and vulnerability from a female perspective. Because we know that women are most often likely to cycle fear as a reason for not cycling. So what happens with that less women cycle? Um, the cities and the women lose the health benefits come from you know, women cycling. We end up with a massively suboptimal place. Um, uh, and, and, and Dr. Gerard looks at um, different places where um, the infrastructure, back to our arguments about bike infrastructure, is safe and places where they are sa uh, aren't safe and where they are safe. So in cities where the, and the infrastructure is not safe, you get a gender split of 70-30 men, women cycling, because the crazy men are cycling and the sensible women are not cycling. In Amsterdam, Copenhagen, where it is safe, you have a 50-50 gender balance. And, and Dr. Jarrod says, and Marianne says she quotes this everywhere she goes, if you want to know how safe a cycling how safe a city is for cycling all you have to do is go out and count the number of women who are cycling because women read the situation it's a great proxy for how safe things are so sorry that was a very long and convoluted way of saying we got to move on beyond simply saying women are vulnerable and need special treatment we've got to ask how we tackle some of the questions the specifics of you know design and service and, and and the gender habits and gender attitudes which are making women more at risk by the way i can't go on without mentioning that marianne who works for this great organization rambo they're bringing out a report in january looking exactly these issues so um, maybe we should flag that up on twitter afterwards because it's going to be a very interesting report thank you but is it is it if you if you if you maybe come to the conclusion it's about making the invisible needs visible because um, I really like to talk with minorities, with people in wheelchairs, with people mm. who are blind, with people who, like my daddy, have some health issues because I think um, we can learn so much from the people we call the minorities. And mm. it's also, uh, for me, uh, also privileged, white, uh, uh, well-educated. Tell me about it. <laughs> so for me, I also have blind spots, and I also, I, one example was I, I talked to Raoul Krauthausen, who's an activist uh, for, for wheelchair mobility, it's one of the topics he got, but um, I, I totally was uh, disturbed that he um, always wants to go uh, with a train, um, because he could um, have a taxi also but now five years later i understand he wants to decide by himself how he uh, is building his mobility surroundings so mm -hmm. he he wants to have the freedom of choice and that is to totally fine because we live in a democratic uh, system where everyone has to find his needs and 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 fulfill this uh, these needs and um, um, so that is maybe the last point to, to put a light on, we always struggle to, to um, be one bunch of people changing mobility for the better. Uh, when I started, um, people call me a cyclist. And I was like, <laughs> what? I'm a, I, I, I get I, the I'm same. I get the very same. often, but I'm not, not a cyclist. Yeah. You're a like human being. Old man <laughs> in some clubs, I don't know. And and that disturbed me so much because um, people triggered me, what kind of mobility do you use? And I was like, every kind of, mm. I also have like car sharing needs sometimes. Uh, is yeah. this the first failure we are doing that we always falling apart? You're a pedestrian. Ooh. Yeah, uh, yeah, every day. Yeah. And that is, uh, yeah. for me, it's really funny that we we try to change. But we don't think it's it's a it's a group. We separate always the kind of mobility. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And how can we change this? <laughs> what is oh, your idea? I mean, I think, well, I mean, that's a great example. I mean, I think we've got to think a bit about um, uh, you, uh, this whole concept of I'm branded as a cyclist because I do cycle a lot, and and like you, I use a car sometimes, and um, but we walk everywhere, and too often. Well, I, I want to say a bit about this, you know, uh, the idea that, you know, we, we put different groups against each other just to take the vulnerable 
or if you like, I'll say the sustainable urban mobility crowd. Okay, so who who are people making uh, urban mobility sustainable? It's people who are riding their bikes, people are walking, people are taking public transport. So this should be a natural coalition of interests around making cities. But, you know, I go around, I hear all the time about pedestrians saying, I hate cyclists. Oh, God, they they ride into me. And I'm fully, you know, I recognize every day that I see cyclists not always behaving well. And then I see it. And then cyclists saying, yeah, no, those stupid pedestrians, they walk in front of me because they don't listen out for me. They don't look out for me and they don't care. And then you hear conflict between um, more at the service provision level between cycling promotion groups and, and public transport prison groups. And they say, you know, in Brussels, I've heard debates, oh, we shouldn't be building all these bike lanes. We should be putting our money into um, bus transit and um, uh, and new metro lines and, and all these things. And we're focusing on the wrong things here. And it's stupid because we need everything. We need all of these things. To take an, a sort of post-corona situation, what's happening is we've had a terrible drop in public transport use because people are scared to use buses and trains, I'm afraid. And that's something we've got to address, by the way. We need to get that back to the level of comfort where it's like going to the supermarket. It's not just, it's not complete without risk, but, you know. Um, and then we need alliances between the bike community, the walking community, and the public transport people. How do you do that? Look at the Dutch. You build bike parks at train stations. You enable people to take bikes on trains. And I'm glad to say we've just passed legislation in the European Union, which is going to require that over time. There'll be more spaces for bikes on trains. Um, but And we need to get the communities, I, I nagged them here in Brussels, to work better together and not to try to, you know, sort of argue against each other, but to argue with each other mm -hmm. to build this better livable city. The thing, I mean, the one, the group that most often that gets forgotten about is the pedestrians. And I want to say a word about that because there was a great piece uh, yesterday, if you saw it in The Guardian um, of yesterday, uh, talking about a study, and I'm, I'm going back into advertising mode here, from the <laughs> uh, Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, the IDTP, which is a study of the world's most walkable cities and it's a great it's a great study because basically it looks at the city measurements you know the different maps you know so like london has got very different needs to paris in terms of the size how much inclusivity is there in the transit system and then it looks at different indicators neighborhood by neighborhood and then visiting a street and i strongly recommend it to you and i strongly recommend also you and your listeners um, look at um, groups like walk 21 and the Institute for, um, not the Institute, the International Federation of Pedestrians, the IFP, who are looking exactly at these issues about establishing walkers' rights. And they're a very interesting example of a phenomenon, which is if you don't, you don't need special clothes to go walking, but you don't, you know, you don't need to buy a bicycle. You don't, some would say you don't need a lane. So all of pedestrian activity is forgotten, basically, more or less, in towns at least, because you don't need special equipment and there's no market for it. So there's another example of market failure. We need to find ways in which to we specifically encourage safe uh, walking areas in cities. And again, back to the equity point, and this is something truly bizarre. If you look at the poorest neighborhoods in the city, where we know there's the fewer access to, the least access to cars, the pavements or the sidewalks, as the Americans call them, are the worst or the narrowest or the least appropriate to go along with the pushchairs and kids. And you go to the richest neighborhoods in the city, and this is in Europe or anywhere in the world, where everyone is driving to go to the corner store. That's where the pavements are beautiful and manicured. And, and so that's a much bigger question about where the, where the taxes are spent on all the rest of it. But it's back to the equity thing and making pedestrians visible and, and thought about and cared for in our urban planning. So I'm, always, I'm waving a flag to the pedestrians here today, Katya, because I'm a pedestrian too. As well as everything else. As we got now five minutes to go, I can't leave you with Oh my god, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Um we can't I can't let you go without that. without uh, um having a picture of Brussels because uh your city is changing also and yeah <laughs> it sees the congestion, okay. Um but um I, I I'm really um see someone who's working for a German broadcast and he's always telling oh, what is happening here in Brussels you won't believe it it's it's really changing I don't know 
Um, how is your feeling um, living in, in Brussels? What are the people and the mayor doing uh, to change mobility right now? Well, then I risk stepping into local politics here, but I'll take a few chances. I've been in this town for 27 years, no, no, 24 years, and it's been transformed. Um, been transformed by local governments, by regional governments. I mean, when you started, I started out riding my bike, not as a cyclist, but just someone who rides a bike. Um, it felt like you were making a sort of radical uh, statement. You know, this was, you know, whoa, <laughs> I'm really out there. And now it's becoming like Copenhagen, like Amsterdam. Not We're not there yet. Um, you know, just something people do to get around. I once had an altercation with the mayor of Copenhagen who said, welcome to uh, Copenhagen where cycling is cool. And I said, no, it's not. It's just what you do. It's how people get around. And that's what's happening here in Brussels, not just on cycling, but on pedestrianization. The whole of the downtown areas is urbanized. And there's, again, uh, free advertising, the Good Move Plan, it's called. And this is the plan for, for Brussels mobility in the coming years. 30 kilometers an hour will be default Somehow I managed to adjust my screen so you can't see it. There you go. Um, <laughs> 30 kilometers an hour is going to be the default speed limit from the 1st of January 2021 with everything that entails enforcement, infrastructure, um, public attitudes. I mean, it's, it's going to mean that the speed limit signs of 30 are going to disappear because if you can't see a sign, it's 30. And you're going to see more 50 on the few roads, so the trunk roads, like the one I was talking about, the ones coming in to the center of Hanover. Um, those roads, uh, if they're properly protected, are going to be 50. So it's going to be a revelation, a revolution uh, in this town uh, if we can get these things done. Um, there are all sorts of ideas cooking, um, some of which are, you know, are, are not yet uh, out there. But I, and I, I just want to say a, a, a hymn here to local decision making. Because too often um, when you have, um, uh, you know, uh, the European Union is telling you to do this or your national government is telling you to do this, that's when you see opposition. Um, a speed limit imposed from the center of the European Union or the national thing, that's going to feel like, what are they telling me what to do? But if a city uh, uh, and a commune in a city says, we want a, a 30 kilometers hour speed limit because it's about our children and you're not driving your car through at speed, then it becomes more politically deliverable and it just turns the entire political logic on its head. Anyway, I mean, um, it's also an interesting lesson historically because if you look at Amsterdam and Copenhagen and Utrecht, they weren't always cycling cities. They became cycling cities because the decisions were taken at the political level to change and not just cycling, but walking and decisions were taken to make cities like this. And my final word on this is we're going to need to do that. We've just done a great project here in the EU called the 100 Climate Neutral Cities by 2030. It's under the um, Horizon Europe plan. And it's it's basically looking at what we need to do in 100 cities to drive climate change. And that is the ultimate, Katia, the ultimate existential question we all face. If we don't tackle that, uh, uh, None of this is going to be relevant. But the beautiful thing is if we tackle climate change, CO2 emissions, air quality, safety, congestion, these are the co-benefits of these changes, and we can get there all in one go. That is a nice word at the end. Thank you so much for this livable. Thank you. <laughs> And I will I a on, uh, at Brussels. I will. I will uh, get to all the the, the things Come visit. named. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've been there once, and it wasn't really nice. So I think I will. Well, be... come here, and we'll have a good Belgian beer, <laughs> and I'll show you some of the new areas. I'd really like that. Would be nice. So I wish you a nice uh, Friday, a nice weekend afterwards, and thank you so much for your time. Stay here. Thank you very much, and thanks bye everyone bye. for listening. If there was anyone there listening, thank you as well. <laughs> bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>